Okay, hi. So glad that you're all here. So tonight we're going to be listening to, I think he's number five in our speaker series um, on the death question and exploration of the end. Um, and we have Ryushin Sensai here from Zen Mountain Monastery to talk about his perspective and the Zen Buddhist perspective on death and the end and such matters. So, thank you. And you know, thank you for inviting me again to come here. Um, it's been now you know, three or four years that I had a chance to visit Bangkok. Um, how many of you have I met before this? How many of you have attended last year's lecture? So I know that if I start repeating the same stories, I'm <coughs> asleep. It's an explanation. Um, the death question. Um, I'm, I'm not going to speak from the Zen Buddhist perspective. Now, one of the things about Zen Buddhist perspective is that it very quickly uh, establishes that there is no such thing. Uh, many people will ask him, what is the Zen Buddhist perspective on death, on abortion, on suicide, on vegetarianism. Um, that's maybe one of the unique um, things about Buddhism, is that it, it is truly a non-dogmatic, non-theistic tradition, religious tradition, which means that it demands each one of us to establish a certain relationship with the question, with the perspective, and develop that to the best of our own abilities and not seek for somebody else's answer to the questions that only each one of us has to uh, respond to. And the question of death is definitely like that. Um, so um, I'll be speaking to you about my perspective on that, which obviously uh, immediately should make you realize that I'm not qualified to do that because I'm still alive. So I'm not an expert in any sense, the only mm -hmm. those who have died. Um, that can say something about that. But it's here that things become actually quite interesting because as this lecture will develop, um, what I will claim to say is that actually I have died many times. As a matter of fact, I may already be close to be completely dead. And it's because of that and my commitment to perfecting that reality um, that I can actually say something potentially worthwhile to you. Now, it sounds like a lot of bullshit. But the fact is that that's exactly the Zen Buddhist contribution to the question. That I can speak about death because my life's mission and process of living is dedicated to nothing other than on a day-to-day -day basis see through a certain illusion of my existence. And to the degree to which I can do that, meaning to the degree to which I can free myself, from a certain ignorant, illusory perspective as to the nature of who I am, or to make a play to the degree to which I have died to the idea of myself, I actually liberate my life. I become a free entity. And I'll be using um, a term, Great Death, which is a description uh, that is used in Buddhism, specifically in Zen, as a very specific point where a person sees, sees something about the nature of their self, and in seeing that true nature of the self, they are released, they are liberated. And that's the promise that Buddhism makes. Promise not, again, as a theistic, dogmatic, some sort of a philosophical solution, but rather as an experience that is available to every single human being. And we'll get to different things, to some of these things that I'm saying that are pretty thick, hopefully from a couple of different directions. Which, incidentally, um, as much as this is a lecture, a sharing maybe is a better way to put it, um, please jump in. You know, I would hopefully leave enough space at the end of it to stir things up and to get you to question, to pro uh, to offer your skepticism, which is obviously the most important thing in all of this. But if I am saying that on the spot, feel completely out of line and somehow not computing or are not accessible, stop me, ask your questions so we can then turn and address things that might be worthwhile for you to understand. Um, what I'm going to try to do during this lecture is to convince you that you don't exist. 
all right? Um, and if I can succeed, you will be re relieved from the fear and the question of anxiety of death, right? That seems to be logical. If you don't exist, then the question of death evaporates with really that. Um, now, that's obviously crazy, right? You know, from a conventional perspective, even as I'm sitting here and as we're already in the give and take of this discussion, I see you, you see me, you hear my voice, you distinguish certain characteristics and qualities that are undeniable. So the obvious question is, what is this? From the conventional perspective, we are existent, we are here. But that's the question. How sane, how clear is the conventional way that we're seeing reality? What if this conventional way of being here together like this is actually deeply erroneous and not based in reality itself? What if what's going on in this investment and the experience that we're having right now, we're investing in something deeply crazy? So crazy and so convincingly crazy that none of us are able anymore to notice that fact, that we're sustaining and colluding individually, intrapsychically, interpersonally to sustain a certain reality, even by the simple fact that you understand the things that I'm saying by shared language, and in the very understanding, we're already in trouble. If you understand what I am saying, we're in trouble. Because it seems to you that you understand what I'm saying, and obviously you have no clue, you have no access to my mind, but we have learned through a shared language and a shared experience to actually imagine that there is a solidity to this, right? And what Buddhism is continuously saying is, stop, take a closer look. Take a closer look at what you assume yourself to be. Who are you? Who are you as a physical entity? Who are you as a psychological entity? Who are you as an emotional entity? Who are you as an experience of this moment? Those questions seem self-evident. You know, how commonsensical is it to recognize that you're sitting there within this body? Obviously, quite clear where the boundaries of yourself begin and where they end. In terms of your physicality, the contour of your skin, the sense of internal experience versus external experience, to the degree to which you see your thoughts as your thoughts, to the degree to which you obviously have a certain repertoire of emotional responses, history, home. But that again is something that you were born into and developed self-awareness in a very, very cloudy way. Your sense of self emerged without you being participant of that process. At a certain point, probably somewhere around age five or six, you started recognizing that there is this entity that you claimed as yourself. How did that happen? And to what degree are you actually clear, accessible to that process? Buddhism isn't saying you're not there. So when I claim that that's what I'm going to try to convince you, I'm not going to try to convince you through ideas. I'm going to try to convince you through pointing to processes, methods, practices. Specifically practices of training the mind to become an amazingly crisp and lucid tool of self-observation and analysis. Some people call it meditation, something much, much deeper than that. I'm going to point to the inf <coughs> infinite and infinitely lucid capacity of your awareness to illuminate the nature of your experience and reveal to you something which is completely in the dark to us because of the habituation, deep habituation. You can't possibly understand how deep that habit runs through within you. Consciously, unconsciously, as I said, intrapsychically, interpersonally, in this way that we kind of proliferate the myth of the self, the myth of me, and get everybody to kind of collude with that process. So maybe I'll introduce just a hair breadth of doubt <laughs> that may be resonating already within something within you that you intuit that you might have experienced in your life, that brings to question what the nature is of freedom, of happiness, of fear, of anxiety. But most importantly, or what does this all have to do with being able to live a life completely, authentically, genuinely, a life with absolutely no regrets? So indeed, when you find yourself vis-a-vis -vis your last breath, and let's call that death, 
you'll be perfectly okay with that moment. That that moment will be just another moment of complete living. True, nothing different about it whatsoever. Is it possible to be like that? Is it possible to live like that? Is it possible to rest in the nature of your own being in a way where there is absolute unconditional freedom, regardless of the circumstances that you're encountering, including the circumstances of your last breath? Now, to give you a little insight of how this all starts for me, it's kind of weird, but again, I don't think it's that weird. And it's, you know, with time as I spend um, and have an opportunity and the gift of being with people and not being afraid, not being hesitant to enter, to, to talk about things, this forthright with a sense of openness. It's actually that I hear that more and more, almost from everybody, in one form or another. And it's here that the language, the vocabulary, that Buddhism provides actually loosens up the territory. We get kind of less uptight about addressing certain things, which are actually quite plain, quite accessible to all of us, but we don't have a vocabulary to talk about this. So because of that, it's almost like something weird is happening to us. We assume that maybe we've gone crazy, or just there's no way of explaining what this is. But I remember when I was about 10 years old, um, and this is one of those stories that you might have heard <laughs> but it is, you know, for me, it's a kind of a pivotal moment. Uh, somebody asks me these days, how is it that, you know, at this point in my life, I'm a Buddhist monk and doing what I'm doing, you know, with commitment and complete rigorous discipline, dedication. The further I move along away from that moment, the more clear it is that that moment had everything to do with what happened afterwards. And the moment is innocent enough. And as I said, it's a moment that uh, many of us, I suspect as children, uh, touch. And maybe I'm actually one of the duller ones, so you know, I can only remember one of them. <laughs> it could be that we actually write this kind of a path of grace, if you will, of accessibility and contact with reality as, as young people before the doors start shutting down and before the crystallization of the sense of experiencing reality through the filters of our parents, of our culture, of our own psyche kind of close those doors for us. Never completely. They can't be closed completely because of the nature of reality, but sufficiently so that then we are in this flow, collective flow of uh, <coughs> sustaining and proliferating those illusions. So we're, we, we are with my family. It's in Warsaw. It's, as I said, it's maybe early 60s. And um, we went for our regular picnic. You know, that's kind of the thing that Polish families used to do, a lot of walking around the streets. Um, and then hanging out by the river uh, with a picnic basket. And I was playing by myself at that point, and I went, went to the uh, edge of the river and uh, kind of pulled something out of Hesse's Siddhartha, I don't know what it seems like, and I was just staring at the water, throwing rags, just doing you know, what eight, nine, ten-year-old does. And it was an instant, you know, and that instant just opens and closes. And in being in the state of what I would imagine it to be, you know, I don't remember the exact moment, I remember now the storylines that developed around that. There was a moment of being completely awake. You know, I was present, I was present to life. I could see the river, I could feel the environment around me, and there was a deep sense of relaxation within that. Obviously the family was around, I felt safe, there was a sense of nature, sense of stillness around me. And it was almost as if something opened and closed. And what the opening and closing was, this was this question, this instantaneous appreciation that I was in doubt. That meaning that my being became doubtful to me. And what that experience pivoted on is recognition that the moment of time, now remember, these are words of an adult. That's not something that articulated itself in the moment, but was palpably experientially available to me. That the moment of time had no duration. That literally the experience that I was having had no basis of being there. Which means this experience that you're having right now, that doesn't change. That that was this crack. Crack in perceiving something in my awareness about the nature of my experience. And the fact that my experience was resting on something which was untenable. That a moment was not a second, meaning it did not have a beginning or an end. It wasn't half a second, it wasn't quarter of a second, it wasn't one millionth of a second, it wasn't one billionth of a second, it wasn't Planck's constant of a second. 
It didn't have a beginning, it didn't have an end, it did not have a duration. So what the hell is this? How is this happening? How is my sense of being available to me, to my experience, to my consciousness, if indeed it is impossible for it to be actually present because the nature of time is such that I don't have that time. You don't have that time. None of us has that time. And yet, obviously, the solidity of this experience is undeniable. And that was not the content. That's the Buddhist vocabulary addressing that process. That's the vocabulary of looking at that moment for the last 30 years of my life. That's the vocabulary of training the mind to become a weapon, weapon, bro, I don't like to use that word, the tool, maybe the tool, the instrument, the instrument of precise matching and analysis, experiential analysis into the nature of reality. What I do remember <coughs> is the feeling state that came with it, which was paradoxically ambiguous. I was at the same time terrified and exhilarated. There was a sense of such profound terror that in the aftermath, my parents nearly hospitalized me. But at the same time, I realized that I tapped something, that I tapped the source of freedom, that to the degree to which I could actually somehow appreciate that moment, to that degree, I was free. I was completely free. But the door opened and closed, and the only thing that left in the aftermath was a very, very confused state of mind. As I said, that was manifesting an unconsolable crying, the sense of fear, nightmares, and my poor parents were completely and discombobulated about what the hell to do with this. Just fortunately, you know, the, the youthfulness kicks in, just getting out on the soccer field, you know, doing a few things, kind of allowed for that to be forgotten, except that it never was forgotten. It just kept on popping up in different ways, in different appreciations throughout my life. But in some ways, I think there was also wisdom within me that was basically saying, don't go there, not just yet. You don't have the tools to handle this. And those tools became available without any problem when somebody finally showed me how to do meditation, how to do Buddhist meditation. How to actually become still and turn my attention to this question of what is the nature of myself? Or more specifically, what is the nature of your experience? Understanding very quickly with time that in no way was I endangering the fact that I could still sit here and communicate with you or really enjoy a cold beer after a game of frisbee. No, don't worry about it. None of this goes away in the process of addressing this question. No, my humanity, my capacity to be precisely the way I am, seemed to remain. And yet, what was being given up is a certain attachment, certain investment, certain project of trying to sustain security and stability and concreteness about something that actually didn't need that much attention. As a matter of fact, didn't need any attention at all because it wasn't there to begin with. At that instant, in a very real way, I died. That was the first taste of it. Now, the fact is that we are doing that moment to moment to moment. You know, as we're able to move across time, or apparently as we're seeming to move across time, or maybe more accurately, as we are evolving as time itself, as our process of change from moment to moment is availing to us, we actually are going through that process of being born, dying, being born, dying, being born, dying, probably infinite number of times within any stretch of time. So that experience of continuity <coughs> that we superimpose on it is resting on something much, much more ineffable, much, much more mysterious, much more ungraspable. And as a matter of fact, it has to be that way. In a very, very logical, philosophical way, in a very basic quantum mechanics kind of way, there can't be anything about you in this moments of experience that moves to the next moments of experience as the same thing. Not an atom, not a sub-atom, nor anything superimposed on that. If there was continuity, if there was something 
that's moving across time that is constant, everything would to be constant. The world would come to a perfect halt. It would stop. Those are big ideas, and I'll kind of go that way, but then we'll collapse to things that are much, much more, if you will, accessible to what things that we can verify ourselves on the spot. So Buddhism, yes, is very much what seems to be enamored with death. You know, I don't know how it works in the other traditions. I know how it looks these days in the Western culture, you know, that death is kind of kept on the periphery. In Buddhism, we kind of celebrate it all. It's not a big deal. You know, the fact is that the whole tradition, you could say, is predicated and based on one person's deep experience, deep fear of their own death. So if you take Shakyamuni Buddha as the historical person who begins this tradition, and it doesn't make any difference if you see him as a person or if you see him as some sort of an archetype representation of some basic aspects of humanity. He was okay, or so it seemed. You know, he represents that person who really is located within his own life, within society, in a way that feels to him like it's completely fulfilling him. So you can superimpose on that all of your wishes of your own perfect life. You know, it's the perfect partner, perfect body, perfect loving parents, perfect capacity to express his own, care and attention to people around him, civic responsibilities, intellect that was as sharp as a tack. Everything is in place, right? So why is it that he's so continuously anxious? Why is it that the angst, if you have this pervasive fear, almost increases as the apparent perfection of his life is starting to be met? You know, isn't that the case? That it's almost the more clear and stable things are, the more we realize on a certain level just how unstable they are. How subjected they are to the laws of chaos and impermanence. That doesn't make a difference. What it is that you state yourself on, intellectually, materially, emotionally? You know, I know, that it's already slipping through your fingers. That impermanence rules. That you like to take on permanence head on is guaranteed that you're going to lose, no matter what playing field you're going to do that on. But it's amazing how effectively we can actually screen ourselves from that. And so he did, too, until truly the encounter with old stage started seeing, appearing to him, the reality of that and the recognition that that was his own experience. Illness, loss of control, illness across the board, dis-ease, if you will, and then death. He saw a dead person. And in India in those days, there were a lot of dead people around. Still are. You know, death hasn't disappeared from the landscape. It's there. It's directly in your face. You're seeing corpses. You're seeing the pyres. You're seeing, you smell it. The body's burning. It's not like us. It's not clinical. It's not behind closed doors. It's very much there. It's very much part of life. But for him, it was shocking. Given his protected, almost perfectly managed environment, where somehow that myth of what? Truly, of immortality, if you will was available to him. And that kind of popped the door open, and that's actually what got him on his path, of wanting to find freedom. Find freedom from death. Find freedom from fear of death. And the fact is that he accomplished it. That in his own mind, when he realizes the nature of his life, and specifically the nature of his selflessness, he equates that with conquering death. And as a matter of fact, in the epithets that you see around the Buddha, he's the conqueror of death. But it's fascinating how he frames that when he starts to talk about how it is that he conquers death. He always speaks, I've conquered death because I have eliminated birth. Nothing will ever come into being, and nothing ever coming into being, it will not be subject to that. And so we're coming back to that question, and I'm going to try to convince you that you actually don't exist, that you never did exist, that you actually did not come to birth. And to the degree to which you can realize that, that is the liberation from death itself. And obviously there's beautiful logic about that. But it's not, again, a philosophical issue. And it's here, again, that we come back to why is it that we're talking about this? And why is it that I'm coming here to talk to you about the question of death? Is it a philosophical issue? 
If so, I failed miserably. Or does this actually have to do with living? You know, why would I? Why would you be interested in a question of that? Are you? I mean, it's a hell of a topic. I have to, you know, nod with a certain amount of uh, fascination that you're able, that you are able to put that, you know, into the face of other students here, you know, at your young age, to want to look at that. But why are you doing that? You know, why did you come to this lecture? I mean, is it truly, is it a philosophical conundrum for you that you want to write a paper about? Or obviously, is it something that you're recognizing is intimately to do with your life? Because yes, you will have to face this. Fact is, you're already facing it. You know, at the monastery, the accent is continuing, still remembering that. Keeping in mind your own demise. Not as a morbid preoccupation, <laughs> No, truly, as a way to remind yourself of how to celebrate this life. Because too frequently, if we forget that, we truly can lull ourselves into a sense of security where we think we have time. Where we actually, not overtly, but somewhere in the depths of our mind, think ourselves immortal. It's kind of the immortality project that I think we all suffer from. <laughs> it's the immortality syndrome. How do we? How do we can maintain ourselves, sustain ourselves in this idea? How do we can keep at bay, out of the spectrum of our awareness, the fact that literally, as this lecture began, you know, 25 minutes ago, you are 25 minutes closer to your death. Okay. That's a fact. Try to disprove it. <laughs> <laughs> And again, as I said, not to become somehow obsessed and let that slip into a form of paralysis, but no, how to really appreciate that our freedom, that the question of how to live this life completely has to include the realities of what my human life comes with. And it comes with the fact that I, you, will grow old, are growing older, that we will lose control and be uneasy with ourselves, and that we will die. And then the remarkable thing, not remarkable thing, the kind of a you know, twist, the, the little twist of, uh, of you know, what may seem like unfairness, is that none of us knows when that moment of death will come. You know, again, we have. If I were wanted to push you, and if you wanted to go there with me, you have your imagination of your ideal death. You, know, you probably want to do it with those who love you around you or maybe in a horrific, dramatic accident in the Everest. I don't know. You know each <coughs> one of us has our flighty ways of thinking about it, but we do. But the fact is we don't know. It can happen now. I may not be able to f finish the stop. My cholesterol is okay. I've checked it. <laughs> so I think we're all right. But, you know, something could happen. The re-entry of the satellites, could just bring him directly on top of this building and be done. <laughs> and so it goes. What's obviously much more important and in a very real way more disquieting is that impermanence is continuously throwing those kind of balls at us. You know, you are being insulted by reality. For the most part, you're doing great. Again, because we are wealthy, we are in the West, we have tremendous degree of control over our lives, so the buffer zone around us is pretty significant, but not complete. And as I said, impermanence continuously slips through. We continuously get walloped. You know, he doesn't like me. She likes the other one. <laughs> little deaths, you know, little punctures and balloons of ego. Little, literally little insults to that project of me trying to keeping myself as the solid entity, as the sense of something that I have control, I have familiarity with, that I can assure myself to be here and then to be here the next moment. And as I said, life just is kind of chomping at that little Pac-Man or pac eating at the edges of that reality. And so we do. We, we, we are invested in our own mortality. We're invested in some intrinsic sense of who we are. I am that self, and I know that self, and that self is what will travel with me for the rest of my life. 
in face of evidence, <laughs> scientific evidence, to the contrary. But we're good. Our minds are amazingly beautiful in that sense, amazingly skillful and continuously kind of staying half a step ahead of the process. It almost seems like we are on arrival being welcomed by a welcoming party of us saying how wonderful it is that you have arrived here just as I expected you. It's great. I mean, it's really the genius of the human mind that is played out that way. And a deep appreciation that we should have for that. We are remarkable creatures in that sense. And our capacity to bend our consciousness and sustain that sense of the self in face of impermanence. How do we kind of keep impermanence at hand? Primarily it's just by distraction. Well, first, well, no, it is. You know, distraction probably comes best. That is that if we can keep our mind busy, we just don't notice what's going on. That's probably why we have to move so fast, why our communication is continuously speeding up, how we are able to sustain this air of imperturbability about us. You know, when that starts to break through, and that level of distraction, remember, D I S T. R-A-C-T-I-O-N. You know, that happens on every level. You know? So it can be very gross. It can be you know, plugging in continuously into something that pulls us mind away from the moment of our awareness. But it can be much more subtle than that too. And then if that fails, then an overt denial can become available. Then there's also this kind of an acting out, what psychologically will be termed reaction formation, where we'll just play it out, we'll kind of act out through hedonism. And this way we think we somehow will defeat death. Just like go for it, carpe diem. You know, just like cut loose because you know that you die. That too is actually not as primitive method of trying to keep that at hand, but quite effective. And then we're able to project ourselves through primarily our ideas into the realms beyond that. So many religions have actually staked on that. You know, they offer you the out by saying, there is something constant about you. Let's call it the spirit, the soul, the Atman. Let's say there is some seed of constancy. And you can't put your finger on. Scientifically, I can't locate it. Scientifically, I can't locate anything constant about you. That's already been done. Physics confirmed what Buddha discovered 2,500 years ago. But then you posit, you posit the spirit, you posit the soul. And in a very real way, for many people, that is a security blanket. That will go on forever. That's the expression of my mortality in realms, in realms other than what it is graspable to me. The Buddha said, sorry, no such thing. Because notice what happens when you make yourself available to in some ways, you could say, you know, I can take care of this later, whenever the later is. Buddhism is saying, no, you can't take care of this later because there is no later. Never mind there being something in the later. No, there's just no later. The only thing you have is this moment, and then when you look closely at this moment, it's not even sure you've got that. So really, pay attention. Really learn to pay attention to what truly is about to you. What is the nature of your life? And in the more mundane approach, an expression of that is not so much that we spend a lot of time thinking about what will happen after we die as a reincarnation or so. And incidentally, let me just take that away right away. Buddhism does talk about reincarnation as the last resort, and it's primarily to just give people, those people who need that, some way of coming back to look at the nature of what that means with respect to this moment. In Zen Buddhism, we don't even go there. So like, you know, am I interested in reincarnation? Not at all. How do I relate to reincarnation? I see that as yet another religious entertainment. A way of providing me, preventing me from paying attention to where I need to pay attention, which is this. You know, how often we do that. We give ourselves an out, we give ourselves an excuse to distance ourselves from the only place where we can actually do something, engage something, study something, which is obviously available only here, within this moment. So now, let's kind of get a little bit more specific. 
come, come back to the question of what is it that I'm saying when I'm trying to convey to you that you don't exist. Buddhism looks at the nature of human experience in a very simple, direct way. It says that in, in a uh, useful way, skillful way, it might be helpful for us to look um, at the fact that how it is that the self is organized. And it's here that the Buddhist psychology, again, is amazingly lucid and clear and anticipates pretty much anything and everything that has happened over the last 120 years in Western psychotherapy as begun by Freud and this kind of a deep analytical study, not through the meditative subjective experience, but through interpersonal experience of therapy. So it's most of the Western study of the nature of the self emerges within a dialogue. You know? The Buddhist approach is intrasubjective, meaning that I am given the tools, specifically the tools of quieting my mind and sharpening the capacity to become aware, and then directing that towards my own experience. In therapy, I'm asking you to help me do that as a reflective mirror, as a way of, through interpersonal space, let me gain access to myself. But I'm bouncing that off you. Well, you, if you're a good therapist, bouncing that off you. <laughs> That's usually required in good therapy. If it only happens one way, get out of therapy. <laughs> you're being used. <laughs> All right? So in a sub intrasubjective place of really studying the nature of how it is that we're putting this reality together, what, what is recognized is this, that there is, there is a thing that you might refer to as the psychological self. What is the psychological self? It's essentially everything that you can do as a well mature ego. You can experience sensory input. You can see things, hear things, taste things, smell things feel things kinesthetically within your body and you can think things. That's it. That's essentially the sum total of what constitutes your experience. You can feel things. You can have emotions. You can initiate actions. You can discern differences. You can have a sense of self-worth. All of those things are basically components of a human neurology and relationship to the environment. And that's undeniably there. The, the, the psychological self is the sum total of your experience right now. But then there is another sense of self, and this is what's technically referred to as the ontological self, that comes into question. Because most of us, within that experience that I just described, within the experience that you're having right now, you're positing another sense of self, an inherently existent reality of something which is continuous, from moment to moment to moment. If I push you, and if you really start looking at it carefully, that sense of self would start breaking apart. But as long as it's not conscious, as long as it's kind of in the background, it's like a shadow, all of you have that sense of self. When you look for it, when you try to identify and point to it, that's where the problem will begin. You'll start seeing that that sense of ontological self is really nothing other than a very convenient, amazingly convincing concept. It's an idea. It's an idea that you're holding in your mind on many different levels. There is the very overt one, right? I would ask you, one page essay right now, who are you? Give me the answer to the question of what is the self of you. You would be able to write that down, right? I mean, you'll go somewhere. You'll describe your body, you'll describe your past, history, You'll describe your future. You'll describe certain conditions, but what you'll be convinced of is that if I ask you to write that in another hour, it pretty much would be almost the same, right? That there is a sense of self that you know is continuous. You are recognizing yourself as the same self that began this lecture. Or even that said, Wah! when your head popped out of your womb. And that's going to be the same self when you're going to be breathing your last breath. But look closely at that. That's insane. What is the continuity? I mean, how is it that you are claiming the same selfness that was there 18 years ago, that will be there 60 years ago? What is that? That's the ontological self. But it's amazing how invested we are in it. How unmistakably true it is. Shit, I mean, consider this possible. Right? You go to sleep every night. I mean, you do that. You fall asleep, 
let's say you have dreamless sleep, six hours, eight hours, on weekends, 10 hours, maybe a little bit more. Complete blackout, right? You're not tracking your sense of self. You fell asleep as Michael, right? Eight hours later, you wake up. And the first instant of wakefulness, you know that you're still the same Michael that fell asleep. How the hell are you doing that? Have you ever considered? How are you tracking the continuity of that sameness? That's how deep it runs. I mean, recognize that somewhere within your mind, you need to be tracking the fact that it's the same person that falls asleep. And it's not happening with you actually maintaining some level of conscious, deliberate sense of tracking. Oh, it's still me, it's still me, it's still me, it's still me, it's still me. It's still me. Ah, wake up time, 8 o'clock, it's still me. We continue <laughs> going forward. Right? How do you do that? How are you doing that right now? How much psychic energy do you have to expend to actually sustain that illusion of continuity? So there is. There is very much a discursive sense of continuity, the narrative, if you will, if you will the storyline of your life that can be compacted to a particular moment. There's the emotional continuity. We pretty much like the same things continuously. As a matter of fact, it's a shock to us when we actually recognize that what we like, suddenly we dislike. <laughs> or what we dislike, we might like. As a matter of fact, we become very protective about that. Why? Why do we have such rigid stance about emotional nuances with respect to the world? There is the, as I said, intrapsychic, unconscious process that sustains the sense of networks just moving <coughs> traveling within your mind, brain, that are keeping the same continuity of the self. And then, as I said, probably the most subtle dimension of that is that we are right now colluding to the fact that you're sitting there and you're a distinct entity than me sitting over here. And we're actually very carefully managing that, that somehow some sort of a crazy bleed through doesn't happen. And if it does, we have problems. It's like, you know, when I actually can feel your pain. How? How the hell am I doing that? Oops. What's going on? What is it that in the moments of empathy, of intimacy, those boundaries start blurring? Why is it that in deep, intimate connection with others, we can both feel so utterly nurtured and so utterly threatened in the vulnerability of something suddenly becoming more porous? And somehow we seek that, and we're afraid of that. How does that happen with respect to the environment, to the people around you, to this planet? The sense that you can feel all of it, and how simultaneously it is so threatening, so painful in a sense, and yet so liberating, so necessary for us to actually take care of each other accurately, convincingly. So I'll claim that, in a sense, we have been born twice. But one of those births is actually a false birth. As a psychological being, as an entity, as an individual culmination of certain conditions, biological, genetic, environmental, yeah, you're here. It's amazing how, you see, with this quality of your consciousness and your awareness, your uniqueness, your human uniqueness of that awareness becoming kind of an expression, unique expression of this universe coming to know itself. But at the same time, there was another birth that happened along the way. And that's the one that kind of arrived unconsciously, if you will, in the picture. You know, it probably starts by the nature of the fact that when you pop out of the womb, your mother and your father are like looking at you and are isolating you from the environment around you. You don't know anything about that. I mean, you kind of came to be within the womb. Where the hell? And the difference between me and the womb? No, that was very difficult to navigate. It was probably a kind of a continuous experience. What was my boundary at that point? Where did I end and where did the uterus begin? What was the bloodstream going through me, her? Oxygen that was basically mixing between all of us, nutrition, which was against exactly one body, and then I pop out, right? And then there are these two pairs of eyeballs looking at me, hopefully smiling, but most importantly, isolating me from the environment. What do I do? I start feeling myself being isolated from the environment. And then the process just becomes ever more complex. And suddenly I do. I start treating myself 
as if I was this entity that somehow is distinct from conditions, culminations of life. Oh, I may hit the blackboard if this feels a little confusing. Consider this. Because this process of our ideation, you know, this kind of isolation of ourselves, and this investment in the intrinsic entity of myself as this idea, actually happened globally, evolutionarily. It obviously had to, had its basis somewhere as the human mind, human brain, human beings appeared on the surface of the world. And something happened about the nature of our mind, our brain, to allow us to isolate itself from the environment by the nature of our self-consciousness, by the nature of our awareness, by the complexity of the neural package, if you will, and its incredible explosive sense of input that must have started to happen to us you know, as compared to the species that came before. I mean, we just get walloped by information, sensory information. And obviously, at a certain point, it became evolutionary useful to start sorting that through and starting to packaging it in a way that we could abstract it and literally give it names. And then, as we started to do that with respect to the environment, guess what? We had to do it with ourselves. It was me, this and this. If there was that, then there was this. If there was this, then there was that. And where before that self-consciousness, that complexity unfolded upon itself, there was just awareness. Within that awareness, there is no possibility of knowing about your death. Do animals know about our death? Always you know, a problematic issue to go because I would have to be inside of the mind of the animal to say that. But if you look at the behavior of animals, it speaks to you that even if they know something about death, their own death, they don't seem to be so distressed about it. You know, when they're pain, oh yeah, they feel pain. No question about that. And that very much looks like there's a subjective experience of pain. But can they project? Do they have the awareness of themselves? And then somehow <coughs> project that self-awareness as discontinuing at the moment of their death? That's not clear, but we surely do. You know, in that self-consciousness, in that self-awareness of myself, now I have a beginning, I have that. And so that happened evolution. And it must have been an amazing moment. It probably was a little bit more than a moment. But of what the unfolding needed to happen. But once it was in the picture, oh boy, it just starts to crystallize everything. It kind of takes over the landscape of your internal experience. The diagram that I was going to tell you, because you know, it's, when I think about these things and when I reflect on the experience of what it is that's accessible to me, I try to bring you know, a sense of what that feels like by using analogies or metaphors. Think about a river. You know, think about a river, and you have to, you know, acknowledge the fact that I can't. Nobody can pull the analogies to match reality, which is ineffable, which is impossible to explain. So go with me. You have to kind of relinquish some skepticism and cynicism and just kind of, you know, get into playing with it. But imagine a river that flows infinitely. It started in the infinite past, it will flow into the infinite future. And it's true, it's a perfectly flowing river, so much so that the current of it and depth of it is such that it really is a continuity without any sense of self-reflexiveness. You know, it's not disturbed. The boundary is perfectly smooth. Perfectly smooth. So it's, you know, it's an ideal condition. It's not, there's no friction. It's not a Newtonian reality. Okay? So it's flowing in such a way that it doesn't perceive itself because it has nothing to perceive itself against. It's all there is, if you will. And here, this is that place where you have to give me a break. For some reason or another, whatever the hell that reason is, an egg forms in that room. You know, some disturbance, some, some intrusion, some intrinsic principle played itself out in such a way that an egg, just a little twirl that water forms in the river. And then that eddy starts to grow and become more complex. Now it's still just water flowing, but now it has a shape. And at first that shape is very, very simple. Nothing happens. It's just a turn of water upon itself. But give it little time. And the complexity of that process starts to grow to such a point that the unfolding of that eddy becomes so dense, if you will, that out of it comes the quality of self-awareness, that the eddy becomes aware of itself, that that swirl of water 
recognizes itself as somehow unique from its environment. And in that instant, you have the sense of self and the sense of environment development. And then as it continues, especially as other eddies appear in the water, it starts to recognize, oh, there is me, there is that eddy, there is me, there is that eddy. And at a certain point, the process becomes so dense that that's the only thing that is being experienced. And what has been lost is the sense that this is all still water. <laughs> that that condition hasn't changed. That still, there is no beginning. Nothing came into being. And nothing is going to end. Yes, there is the condition of that eddy forming from the perspective of the river. It's just still the river. But from the perspective of the eddy, there is a sense, oh shit, there is a beginning and there is an end. There is a difference between me and you. And I know that at a certain point, I will somehow unfold and become the death of me. Notice, the psychological birth was just the sense of conditions being such that you arose to be, and you will go for a time as this flow of the river, <coughs> and will then unfold and continue the way it was continuing forever. But if the density and your clinging and the self-reflection becomes so tight that you really feel yourself to be just that, just that eddy, man, it's a frightening experience. Because it does feel like I came into being and it feels like I will die. The only thing that I need to do in order to relax my anxiety about the whole process is to recognize that other nature of water. Notice that the eddy will not be denied. You will still come to be, you will still you will live your life completely with fullness. As a matter of fact, I'll guarantee you, you will live it with more fullness and more vigor once that anxiety goes, because that anxiety actually fractures you. It stops you. It literally freezes you in protecting, in wanting to protect yourself, of wanting to assure something in that continuity. To the degree to which you can let go of that, what you're returning to, is to that condition that basically is giving you a verification that you are indestructible. You are timeless. You never came into being, you never will cease to be. And yet within that reality, you will be able to come to a 7 o'clock lecture in Bennington College on November 4th. The specificity is in no way denied. If anything, the specificity becomes celebrated. And here comes the usual oops. <laughs> That's only about a third of our <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop here. Um, how much time do you have? Um, we generally say around an hour, but they always vary. So <laughs> you are so uh, uh, correct, politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> That says in terms of, get the hell out of me, stop <laughs> Let me stop here and um, uh, turn to you. Let me just tell you what, what it is that I wanted, what, what was on the agenda besides this. You know, the, the kind of the next story, I wanted to go very practical and just share with you a little bit of our life. Because if you go to the monastery, like, death is everywhere. I mean, continuously, like, just keep repeating things. Then in a kind of a cheerful way, as I said, it's not a morbid place, if anything. It's kind of festive you might say, in a unique kind of way. But we do, we quite seriously take on this um, rather systematic way of not protecting ourselves. Just recognizing when it is that we get queasy about the simple facts of that. You know, so the fact is that there is a monk, one of our monks is an 87 year old woman, you know, who is actively living towards death. Um, she's quite remarkable. So, you know, we, we put her as close to our lives as we can. You know, rather than moving her to the perimeter of the monastery, <coughs> you know, her room is smack in the center of where we are, and the door is always open. So as you're walking by, you can hear her, you know, her sleep gargling as her congestive heart failure is kind of bringing her closer to the, to the last breath. Because that's part of our lives. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. What's the big problem? You know? And likewise, in our liturgy, in our rituals, there is, there is just simple acknowledgement, not just that, of the whole picture, the whole picture of who we are. So that was one thing I wanted to share with you, which is not that um, maybe important to you unless you want to come to the monastery. And then I was going to look 
and just address more directly you know, this fear of that core point that we have, which in some ways, again, is usually slightly <coughs> that again, we, it's a convenient uh, default mechanism. But to put it bluntly and to kind of change <coughs> what I'll say is that your fear of death is nothing other than a cover-up for your anxiety, anxiety to really live. That it's actually much, much more difficult for us to tolerate our anxiety that, is, that has something to do with the thing that I told you at the beginning. This anxiety that arises from the existential dilemma of not being sure if you're actually alive or if you're alive in the way that you thought you were alive at this instant. As in that question of like, where are you experiencing this moment? When is, when, when is now? All right? That's much, much more difficult for us to be at ease with. So as a kind of a way out, we can invest in the fear of death. But if you really think about the fear of death, you already know what it feels like. In a kind of a similar way, that sleep provides you this kind of a deep question about the nature of the self. Notice that every time you fall asleep at night into that deep black hole of consciousness, that's how your death is going to feel like. You've done it many, many times. You've rehearsed it. It's okay, it's cool, no big deal. It's like you're going to do it again tonight, right? If you're going to be falling asleep, you know, there's no guarantee you're going to wake up. You're shutting down, <laughs> the system is going disconnect. Right? So again, it's not a, you know, when we really start looking at it honestly and openly, that's not a problem. We're not afraid of dying, we're not afraid of death, we're petrified of completely living. We're petrified of letting go of that illusion of the self. That's the fear. And that's not the fear that you wait for until dying. That's going to be damn scary, I guarantee you. As a matter of fact, from the time, you know, from the fact that when I had, and I'm fortunate that I spend a lot of time with people who are dying as a physician, as a pediatrician, as a psychiatrist, you know, somebody who somehow found himself around you know, people who die, it's remarkable to watch that people who are afraid of dying are people who are afraid of living. People who live, who are able to seek intimacy, and relinquish the vulnerability and security in their lives have no problem with dying. It's just another moment, another breath, that's it. Okay? So that's maybe the important thing to, to, to acknowledge. And the point that is connected to practice, you know, what does this all have to do with why I'm here? Because the Buddhism is saying there is a way to become intimate with yourself, to essentially to die to that grasping of the self. And to the degree to which you can do that simultaneously, you're becoming a much more full and complete participant in your life. And simultaneously, you are actually getting closer and closer to that place where that final challenge of letting go is, you know, on your deathbed. It's okay. Let me stop and kind of throw it your way. And if you, know, if you want me to elaborate on any of this, I'll do that. But anything, any questions, any challenges, because, you know, that, 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 that you have to this, or any, you know, things that pertain to the practicality of it. And maybe let me just say, because if any of you need to split earlier, I brought three things. There's just a brochure about the monastery that kind of describes who we are, where we are, and we're close. Two, um, um, over the last maybe five, six years, I've been making a lot of contact with colleges around New England. Um, more like around here, around three hours away from And every year I, uh, I lead a retreat at the monastery, what I refer to as the missing ingredient of the contemplative element in higher education. And it's primarily, not primarily, it's both offered to students and to educators, to professors, to teachers, who want to understand how that contemplative evocation of silence and recognition of a certain depth of our mind can and very likely is helpful in anything else that we choose to do, including learning, including the process of gaining kind of access to the dimensions of our mind. But then well beyond that, into our <coughs> emotional well-being, intellectual well-being, interpersonal well-being, and these days, ecological well-being. You know, it's clearly connected in my mind to everything that we do. So I brought a flyer about that retreat and way that if you want to find out, you can connect with me. And then I also just brought a little piece of kind of a small flyer 
about the retreat, which is kind of an introduction to the life of the monastery that we do every month. Uh, so once a month there is a retreat, weekend retreat, that kind of introduces people to the practices of what it is that I'm discussing. So if you're going to be going, if you want to grab one of these, feel free to do it. But now, I'll shut up. Any, anything on your mind? Yeah. So we talked about like, colluding on the fact that we all have separate egos. Would you say that like, I don't know, the ideal way for humans to interact is without that, to not collude and to... Um, it's a little bit is more complex. Possible? It is possible. You know, the, the existence of the monastery um, is predicated on that assumption. You know, that uh, the way the, the Buddha framed what is useful in terms of this process of investigation. Um, so, step back. What is Buddha Dharma? What is Buddhism? What is meditation? In my mind, what it is, it's a deep investigation into the nature of my existence. That's what it is. It's not an answer, it's learning how to ask a question. And how to and learn how to ride the tension of not knowing in the direction of mystery. And recognizing those moments when I'm trying to stake myself not on the question but on the answer. Okay? So for me and the way I would offer Buddha Dharma, how I would frame practice of meditation, how I would frame practice of being in a relationship with somebody else. Is that why I am doing this is because I want to investigate this. And by this mean I want to gain intimacy, appreciation. Not abstract understanding, but a living understanding, living wisdom of what it is that I am. All right? Now what is helpful then to do that? Right? And what the Buddha is saying, what the teachings of Buddhism is saying, in the end, use whatever is helpful, but you can kind of divide it in many different ways. And one way that he frames this is what is referred to as the three treasures, or three jewels. And the jewels are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and what it simply translates is, is the, the, the refuge that I'm taking is an intrinsic, intuitive sense of my own wakefulness, and how that wakefulness was manifested in other human beings in the history of the world. Meaning that to do this, I have to trust something, right? Trust something that I don't have access to. Trust something that I intuit, I feel. Trust, trust something that highlights the problem of my suffering, my limitedness, the background of everything that seems slightly off. Right? And I see that, I feel that within myself. All of us do, to one degree or another, because it is available to us. It's an already existent condition that sense of that wakefulness, of that continuity, of that big mind, if you will, that's available to us. It obviously might be difficult for me to access that within myself, although, as I said, for most of us, if you track your life, you'll be able to recognize those moments where you suddenly go, wait a minute, this is bigger. This is bigger than anybody could think about. This is bigger than Einstein. This is bigger than Mother Teresa. This is bigger than the Buddha, the historical figure. That your mind, you know, being in your mind, you know the boundlessness of it for crying out loud. Right? I mean, what, you, you may have the most profound thought, most profound insight, and obviously the question is, what's the space within which that insight is happening? It's there. You know that. Any thought, any experience is happening within a space of your experience. And what the hell is that? So we have continuous access to this boundlessness of our mind, the lucidity of our mind. So he said, look there. The other thing in the Dharma is the facts, the teaching facts, the reality, the details. Take refuge in that. Take refuge in the concreteness of the desk. Take refuge in the concreteness of you know, what your body feels like. Take refuge in the concreteness of a teaching that was offered by somebody who investigated deeply. And then take refuge in the Sangha, the community. Take refuge in each other, right? But not for the purpose of collusion but for the purpose of bursting the illusion. Now, can you do that between confused people? Yes, and it's deeply confusing, but if you keep trying, <laughs> if you keep remembering what it is that you're doing, it's remarkable how that starts to shift. But actually, it's simpler than that. Because let me ask you a question. If you're forming a relationship with anybody, let's say it's a conversation in the dining hall, 
or a relationship with somebody that you have intimate feelings for, and you're going to start turning towards each other, ask yourself a question, why? Why are we doing that? What's the purpose of this conversation? Is the purpose of this conversation that we're having right now, for me and you at the end of it, to feel more separated, secluded, secure in the midst of myself? by establishing differences or codependencies? Or is it, is there a possibility that this conversation could lead towards me feeling more space about myself and offer that space for you? The recognition that I don't, I don't want to trap you in my ideas of who you are, I don't want to trap you in my feelings for you, for who you are, and mutually you're not doing that to me. And so then the conversation or the interaction starts to basically be enlarging the space within which we are experiencing ourselves. Which means that it could be edgy, it could be slightly anxiety provoking, there may be a sense of vulnerability, of exposure, then right. Welcome to the Sangha treasure, to the Indian <laughs> treasure. You know, visit the monastery. I mean, it's a firmness. I mean, you're continuously paying attention of what is the purpose of this coming together. Are we here to basically distract ourselves, talk bullshit, you know, again, sustain 15 minutes of being asleep, or is it possible that we can actually enter a relationship with anything, another human being, an object, the environment, in such a way that it's predicated on the spaciousness of our mind and the fact that we can actually offer that to each other. Yeah. Um, I think something you said struck me about, like, um, communicating and like thought, thoughtful like abstractions as ways of kind of compartmentalizing or um, archiving reality mm -hmm. or something. No, it's not like as that. someone who's most of the, the work that I do either in like you know visual arts or I also like do uh, playwriting and stuff as so much of that is dependent on that kind of abstraction of information and something you get a joy out of but I know that it drives me crazy <laughs> in uh, these particular ways that are completely the opposite of finding that kind of deeper peace and like non-meaning. Um, how, maybe this is another lecture, but like how in a life that has been, already has some partitioned off to that, how do I level the scales? Yeah, yeah. Um, come back to the question of, of what it is that you want to do with this life. Because remember that artists are actually in a position of tapping this, tapping these questions and presenting to the world ways for the world to see itself and be potentially thrown slightly of balance and stimulated and probed and questioned, maybe better than most other approaches, other than religious figures. Uh, I always love um, the quote from Foster, uh, Foster Wallace. You know, he said that art and religion are similar in the same sense that they are meant to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. <laughs> All right. Okay? And so artists can do that. But they have to watch that when they do that, it really is about that and not about themselves. Meaning, as an artist, you have a certain talent. You have positioned yourself within the universe in a way that now your clarity, your, your discipline, your relationship to the skills that you develop as an artist can serve for the purpose of awakening rather than confusing. Okay? What does that mean? You need to stay on the edge of that question of who you are. Meaning don't let the art become art as a way of defining yourself. Has that happened in the history of art? The fact is, it always happens. You can witness that. You know, good art, real good art, comes at the moment where the artist is willing to cut loose, go beyond what is already known. It's just too frequently that the society or the artist get indulgent and self-centered and kind of then collapse and use it and, and try to kind of gain security. It's a particular security for that. But there have been artists who for the whole life been able to sustain that. And I can point them to you. If you want to read, for example, the biography of Giacometti, if you're familiar with visual art, read about him and look at his art. I mean, he's studying the same figure for 30 years. Strangely enough, that figure looks like it's meditating. You know, and when you read him, he's saying, it's just like, I want to understand the human form. Like, what the hell is it? Cezanne was like that also, with respect to light and planes. He basically was looking at things and saying, like, what is this? 
What is the object that I'm seeing with respect to light? You know, it's like, yes, I very easily can imagine the contours and how I can extract that from the environment and space around it. But that's obviously through a close enough, the conditioned way that my retina and my eyes are working. And he just kept looking deeper and deeper and deeper into the little forms that he was encountering and then trying to translate that into expression of his pain. And you can see that. You can see the mind that is absolutely dedicated to trying to see what actually is there. Not what it is that I am abstracting, I'm conditioned to see, but what, what actually is happening there. And few of those people have not been seduced then by the power, by the recognition, but truly stay on the edge of that, of that research process. And if you do, I'll guarantee you, you will nurture people and you will nurture yourself, meaning that in the end, your life is going to be richer. You won't trap yourself within your art. You, you're in a sense, you will become a conduit for the universe to communicate itself through you. It will become like a tube, you know, and the universe will be just flowing and expressing itself in a particular way through you. And that feels tremendously liberating. And again, you know that we know that those moments where we step out of the way and suddenly there's this grace, this spontaneity, this sense of life. I mean, you, you know, if, if you ever listen to interviews with Jerry Garcia and, you know, during the heydays of the dead, when he would talk about those moments where suddenly something happened on the stage. And they did not know it was happening. Everybody in the audience knew it was happening, but they were out of the way. Music was just playing itself through them. And the nurture, the sense of being bathed by something in the audience was remarkable. And that happens again more often than we're willing to acknowledge. Um, hey. Me and something I was reading very recently by an analytical philosopher. He said that if you take eternity to mean timelessness rather than infinite time, then eternity belongs to to those who live in the present. Mm -hmm. But he based that on the assumption that death is not an event in your life, as in you don't go to breakfast and then die and then like you know it's just not an event. So there is no. An end point, that's right. there is not a beginning or a middle point, but that's just speaking about a continuity rather than a constant death or change. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a huge parallel between seeing change as, as the only constant yeah. and actually disregarding that continuity. Yeah. I, I don't know. No, no, you're right on. I mean, it's just the only thing that I'll throw into the pot is that, you know, when he says he's somehow assuming or intuiting that or however it is that he's coming to that conclusion, what Buddhism says, you can verify that for yourself. You truly can. That, that's what all the practice is leading you to, is for you to verify what you just said as your own access to experience with the acknowledgement that when I start talking like this about that experience, I am actually being inaccurate. Because to say that you can have experience of eternity is contradictory to the fact that to have that experience of eternity, you have to cease to have an experience. All right? Now, that's where logic fails. But that's not where the experience fails, because the experience is available to you right now. So in a very sim simplified way, look where it is that you are able to experience change, or more specifically, where is it that you can give yourself a sense of continuity, of something being longer than a moment, right? How do you do that? And it's really not a great mysterious question. If you think about it for a moment, you'll be able to know us. Right? So uh, I'll lead you on. I'll, you know, I'll lead the witness. As I've mentioned, what makes up your experience right now? You can see. You have visual consciousness and capacity to see forms, visual forms. You can hear. You hear my voice. Right? You can smell. Not much smell right now, unless you can is really sweating heavily. All right? um, you can taste things. You know, you might have an aftertaste of the pretty bad chicken there last night. <laughs> um, 
you can feel your body, right? I mean, if you press it on your shoulder, you have an external capacity to kinesthetically feel something pressing against the nerves of your body. You have also capacity to feel internally. And you have a sense of your stomach, you know, grumbling, heart beating, and you can think. True? Can you point to anything else that makes up your experience right now, other than those things? Mm -hmm. Well, you might not accept it as a part of my experience right now, but... Stay with it. No, 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 I, I want to hear my it. My expectations and my memories. Sure, but what are those? What is an expectation? What is a memory? Mm -hmm. It's a thought. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm being very categorical. Literally, that's happening internally in your mind. I can't see your expectations. I can't see your memories. But I surely, in my own mind, literally at this moment, can remember when I was, you know, in Switzerland and went to that church and felt a little short of breath. But that's a thought. Correct? Me describing it to you relies on sound. You heard my voice. So if that's in the sound sphere. So keep going. Anybody wants to jump in? Like, what else is there? To your experience, other than those six spheres of, of little sensory input, because Buddhism basically says that thinking is just a sensory process on the level of the brain. Now, that happens quite organically and amazingly in a complex fashion, and you, out of those six components, create this reality. Your neurological system, your brain, is magnificent in doing that. But now let me ask you, among those six spheres of experience, where is it that you're not experiencing the instantaneousness of the moment? Or to put it differently, where within your experience can you create an illusion of continuity of yourself? Only on the level of thinking, right? It's gone. The sound hits your ears, you sounded, there was a vibration, registered, disappeared, right? Visual form appears, visual form disappears. It looks to us like things are constant, but what is the constancy? What is it actually that says to me that this bottle is the same bottle as the one that I'm seeing right now? Hold that thought. Same thing with smell, same thing with taste. They're instantaneous events. Neurologically, bam, bam, shut down, or just an on, off. Meaning that on the level of the five sensory experiences of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, I'm continuously resting on that instant where things are, like you said, nothing but change. The constants are change. But look at your thoughts. Look how it is that we relate to our thoughts. They appear instantaneously. They literally flash on the screen of our minds. But our relationship to them allows us to invest to a certain degree. And it's as the thought that this bottle travels from moment to moment to moment as the same bottle. Again, that's happening faster and more subtly than you can imagine until you start looking at it. And you recognize that your sense of continuity, of any continuity through time, is predicated on your investment in your thinking. Specifically, actually, in the ignorance of not seeing that process. Because the moment you start illuminating it, the whole thing breaks apart, just like a good fantasy breaks apart. You know, why does a good fantasy work? Because you're not aware of the fact that you're fantasizing. <laughs> If the moment is there that you know that you're fantasizing, the fantasy kind of drains of its juiciness, if you will. Mm. And so what is meditation? What is the practice of doing this? As I said, it's this radical turning of attention onto the process of thought and exposing it, seeing how deeply and how completely we're invested in that. And to the degree to which we can release that and become intimate, to really allow ourselves to what I like to call, like, ride the crest of the wave that's of impermanence, that continuously breaking. It's like if you ever surf, you know, it's like not ahead, not behind. So, but if you catch that sweet spot, you're forever right on that place where something is becoming and disappearing, becoming and disappearing, and that's the only thing that is there. That's literally your life. The thing that anchors it, wraps it, and holds it back is our relationship to our thoughts. All right, let's quit. Yeah. Or at least one more question, maybe? Yeah. Um, maybe you don't want to answer this, which is fine. But I was... Um, maybe I do. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you don't want to hear the answer. <laughs> um, when you said that uh, you don't think there's such thing as reincarnation, mm -hmm. um, that was interesting, uh, not 
because I disagree, but because I think within um, the way that you're explaining things that arise, um, it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if things arise mm -hmm. and uh, all of our senses, in the, including the mind, six sense, so mm -hmm. if all six senses arise um, out of uh, something that's like water mixed with water, right. um, then our sense of self is illusory completely. Even though this is here, mm -hmm. uh, undoubtedly, um, when that goes away, mm -hmm. arising doesn't Seems go away. Yeah, and yeah. since we're not um, separate from the water, mm -hmm. you know, like if the eddy is not separate from the water, then I mean, in a sense, there's no reincarnation. I could see because there's there's no um, thing to arise again. But at the same time, um, there would be no separation between things that are arising in the stream. Correct. So, um, in that sense, it's kind of like, I guess you could see it either way. Like, there is or there isn't. Absolutely. And the reason why, you know, I didn't say that there isn't. I said that I am not interested. Okay. And the reason why I'm not interested in it is for, for two reasons. You know, it's, it's again, much less interest. It, for me to be interested is to be interested in something speculative. The Zen approach to that question of what happens after that is to reframe the question and say, do you know what life is? <laughs> Never mind what happens after that. Look at the nature of the moment. Look at the nature of this thing that we're addressing throughout the lecture. If you penetrate, if you really see clearly through that, you will actually be able to answer the question of what happens after death. Because what happens after death is exactly the same thing that's happening right here, right now. And so to the degree to which you can resolve, discover, open up the nature of this experience, you see eternity. You're seeing the continuousness of everything and every aspect of it. Now, why do I focus on this rather than on that? Because I can actually practice this. <coughs> I can only practice the notion of my reincarnation and what happens afterwards as an abstract idea or a projection of myself into the future as a thought, as a thought that's occurring now. So I'm back here. And to the degree to which I can engage this completely, I will take care of every single moment that I need to take care of. I'm back to that issue of I have learned how to live completely. I have learned how to live intimately. I have learned how to live selflessly. What self then are we reincarnated? Right. Thanks, everyone. Yes. 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 Please, if you're interested, and then when you get closer to the retreat, which is in March, I may connect, want to connect with one of you, and kind of ask to spread the word. Right?